Good day. I am Sergio Lugo, representing the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library and the Rocky Mountain Stamp Show as the moderator for the presentation you will see on the postal history of Lima, Peru. I'd like to take this moment to thank you for your attendance. Our presenter is Henry Marquez. Henry is co-founder of the Peru Philatelic Study Circle and has specialized in only Peru for over 40 years. He has been an exhibitor since 1978. In 1987 and 1988, his Classic Peru exhibit won the Grand Awards at the two largest stamp exhibitions at Lima, Peru. In 2012, he won the APS One Frame Champion of Champions, and in 2017, his large gold medal exhibit, Postal History of Lima, was one of the three runner-ups for the Grand Prix International at the FIP show at Bandung, Indonesia. He has authored several articles on different topics of Peruvian philately. Please welcome Senor Marquez. Thank you, Sergio. The story I'm going to tell you is about resilience. It's about coming back from unfortunate situations. It's about courage. It's about fighting with your neighbors. It's about getting along with other people. It's about people. It's about how a country, and more specifically a city that has all the power of the Spanish colonies in South America, lost everything overnight and it started all over again. This is the story of Lima. Lima is my hometown. I have vested interest in communicating what Lima is all about. And there is one significant item I would like to highlight from Lima, the postal history of Lima, which is basically the reflection of the people living in Lima at that time, is basically the postal history of Peru. That's one thing I would like to highlight. What you will see here is just a very high level view of what happened during these 63 plus years of history on Latin America, in Peru specifically. But before we start with that, I'm going to highlight a few things from Peru in case you are not familiar with the philately of Peru. Maybe you didn't know about this, maybe you do. The first postmark in America happens to be from Lima. It is a colonial postmark. This is the earliest letter with that postmark known, and by the way, it's the only one known. It's from April 18, 1735, Correo Mayor de Lima. I understand there is a Correo Mayor of Mexico, which is a little younger than this. Lima happened to have the oldest one. The first coil stamps of the world were printed in Peru, the Lecoq issues. The only other country that issued grilled stamps was Peru. The other one was the United States, of course. And finally, the first country outside Europe to print postage due stamps was Peru. Let me talk to you about Lima. Lima before 1821. 1821 is the year of independence. But Lima goes back long before that. The Spanish foundation of Lima was January 18, 1535. And at the time of the foundation, Lima was the capital of what later was to be the Viceroyalty of Peru, which at the time they claimed 80% of South America. The green shaded area was the territory where Lima was supposed to be the capital. Of course, that was an aspirational thing from the Spanish people when they show up over there. They didn't know what Latin America size was, but they said, whatever was here is ours. Okay, here you go, you have it. Lima was founded that day, and from that point on, Lima started growing as a, one of the most important centers of civilization in that time, growing into what later was the Viceroyalty of Peru. But when the Spanish show up in Peru, they had it really easy, because there was a civilization there. And this civilization was the Incas, which, by the way, were the latest of all the civilizations that existed in Peru. And they were here maybe for the last 200 years. And over those many centuries, the Incas and the predecessors built something that is a marvelous thing in the world. The Capac the Inca Trail. 
What you see here, those roads over there, this was built by the Incas and the predecessor. All those roads lead you to one city, Cusco, in the highlands of the Andes, the capital of the Tahuantinsuyo, that was the Quechua name of the Inca Empire. Lima was just a little settlement, and in these roads, the Incas and the predecessors already have a mail system. This mail system was run by the Chasquis. The Inca could have fresh fish every single day from the coast in the Pacific being delivered to Cusco, leveraging these roads. Mail was delivered that way. The mail was with some knotted corks called the quipus. We are talking about before 1535. So when the Spanish show up in Peru because they heard that there was this civilization south over there that has lots of gold and all that, all what they did is hit to any port. Capagnan was here. They just follow it. That was the earliest version of a GPS, if you want. All what they needed to do is keep going. Eventually, they made it to Cusco. 150 Spanish uh, conquered Peru. Of course, that was probably also the first biological war because they brought some diseases and started knocking all the natives around. That's what happened. So this was Lima. This is something that happened before that time. 1535 to approximately 1800. That was the Viceroyalty of Peru. That's the colonial time. Around this time and the late 1700s, there were a lot of independence movements in South America. Specifically in Peru, it started with the indigenous people. Tupac Katari, who is a Bolivian, now Bolivia territory, precursor, and Tupac Amaru were the first one who started thinking about liberty for the indigenous people. For many years, the indigenous people were discounted. Nevertheless, they were powerful people. These were people that owned land and ran their own businesses at that time. For maybe 20 years, the Creoles, the Spanish that were born in South America, plus the indigenous people, didn't really have that connection in order to unite to get, or get together and spark the, the independence of Peru. So there was not a lot of movement between those 20 years. In 1810, an important milestone occurred. The Napoleon and the wars in Europe took the Spanish king captive and moved it somewhere else. They put it in jail. And a replacement was put in the Spanish crown. And all the colonies in South America realized that that was the time that they could do something in order to gain independence. So, as you will see, the indigenous people, the Creoles, needed to have a catalyst that in this case was external. And this is true for any country in South America. In one way or the other, that happens in different way. Around 1910, when the King of Spain was put in jail, there was something that started motivating that movement of mail and intercepting mail and started looking into the different people, the patriots that wanted to gain independence. So in the Capitania of Chile, Chile half of what it's today, they issue this postmark, Interceptada de Lima, intercepted from Lima. What this is, is probably the first censorship mark of the world. I don't know if there is another one from another country, but this is 1810. And this postmark was issued specifically for the inbound mail from Lima, because from Lima were coming all these patriotic movements to begin with all the liberatings and independence of the different countries. There are 15 of these letters known. All of them up to today are going to Chile. You will see here the different time of independence of Latin America. Peru is 1821, was one of the latest. The reason is because in Lima, it was concentrated the Spanish power in South America. Lima was the most important city in Spanish South America at the time. Being that, I would like to highlight some of the things that are going to be covered in this postal history review of the Lima events. From 1821 to 1825 is the War of Independence. Peru did not become independent all at once. 
started with Lima and other areas, and the patriotic movements start moving all the way, all the until 1824. From 1826 to 1844 is the political instability period. During this time, everyone wants to be a president. We have like maybe 20 plus presidents during this time. Some lasted as long as three days, others last a little bit longer. So everyone was fighting with one another. They wanted to be a president. From 1845 to 1869, this is a very important period. Something fantastic happened. Wano, the fertilizer, was discovered in some islands out of Lima. And it was a fantastic economic boom of the country. This is the period that a lot of the development, the foundational development is being created. And postal treaties were signed during that time and all that. 1869 has something very interesting. One of technology advance no longer was the main thing. Now, saltpeter was found in the southern territories of Peru, but more important, in the littoral department of Bolivia, which was south of Peru. From 1869 to 1879 is the decade of crisis. Peru started coming down, good days came down. In 1879, something very interesting also happened. Chile, our southern neighbor, declared war to Peru. And this war was because they were highly interested in the saltpeter that was in the Bolivian territory, but also in the Peruvian territory. Bolivia, at that time, claimed an allegiance with Peru. And the war was between Chile, an alliance between Bolivia and Peru. The Pacific War lasted for almost three and a half years between Peru and Chile. But with Bolivia, lasted one day. They occupied Antofagasta and all that area. They claimed the uh, Department of Littoral. Bolivians couldn't do anything else. That was the end of the story. Mainly this war was between Peru and Chile. Bolivia just had it in a very short period of time. I also highlighted here the periods that we have now that the Peruvian postal system was only domestic or also international, and some of the postmarks that are found over here during that period. Lima was an important city, and Lima was a walled city. This is the map of Lima in 1810. As you will see, all those pentagons surrounding the, the city, those were the entry points, gates, and different things. This was Lima, one of the few completely walled cities in America. I believe that the other one is Cartagena. I believe that there are one or two in Mexico, but I'm not quite sure. Callao was the port of Lima. Callao is only 10 miles from the Lima city, so it's the port of Lima. The synergy between the two towns is what really makes the postal history of this country and this city very important. Lima couldn't live without Callao. Callao couldn't live without Lima. The synergy is what makes the, uh, most of the important components of our postal history. At this point, I would like to highlight what happens between 1821 to 1825, the War of Independence period. Mail from this period is rare. There is no way to identify it other than the actual date that they belong to that period. This letter, for example, is from December 1821. It goes from Lima to Piura, north of Peru. Piura at that time was already independent. Lima was already independent. Other areas in the highlands were still going through the process of becoming independent. So this could be from the republic territories to the republic territories, if you will. This is papel sellado, or stamped revenue paper. The patriotic forces used this as a way to gain resources to get funding in order to continue fighting and occupying and giving independence to other areas of Peru. Papel sellado, or a stamp revenue paper, from this period were overprinted Peru Independiente, Independent Peru, year 1821, first of liberty. During the period of War of Independence, there is a first year, second year, third year. And as the patriotic movements were moving into different territories, whatever legal document that needed to be processed it had to use this particular st stamped revenue paper. And as they sold it, they gained those funds and they continue funding the, the independence period or the efforts that were going back at that time. 1821, and here is the highlight of that overprint. From 1821 all the way to 1825, 
w Peru was using the same colonial rates as were during the colonial time. Nothing changed, those rates were based on distance, the route, the weight, and a few other elements that make the final calculation. So on January 1st, 1826, the first Republican rates were issued. This table shows the distribution. It still have the weight, the route, and the distance, but they were a little bit reduced. This cover in particular comes from the Andean city of Pasco to Lima, and it shows the two characteristics here. The three over here is the previous colonial rate, but because the distance between these two cities was 53 leagues times three will give you the miles, was reduced to two and a half reales. So it belongs somewhere over here, right there. January 1st, 1826. Of course, they were experimenting with this. They didn't know if it will work or not, if it makes sense. So immediately after, in September 1826, nine months later, they come up with a revised table in order to make this new postal system sustainable. This letter goes from Lampa in the Cusco route to Lima, 282 leaks right here. And it has this MZ postmark. This is a mysterious postmark that has been discussed for years. This is a colonial postmark used also during the Republican period at the very beginning, and later at the time of the introduction of the stamps. Probably in that period is more rare than the other two. The interesting piece with this is that people make all sort of different theories about what MC really means. They call it Maestro Central, that was given to the main postmaster yeah. in order to indicate or mark a special mail that was processed and so forth. So a researcher in Spain found a document that says that in 1800, the, the postal administration issued 12 postmarks with the initials of the month. For years, the only one known was MC. Later, a letter E for Enero or January showed up. Later, there was T for December that was found. With all those in place, and someone claimed to see an F for February, Febrero, kind of make us believe right now that this in reality were, this is one, March, Marzo, but they didn't have any point to, to use it for that. They distribute it for whatever reason. The reason is not known, but right now people are almost certain that these are just the initial of the months. It just took a hundred and some years to figure it out what it was. As I mentioned earlier, while I was looking to, to the roadmap of this uh, postal history exhibit, from 1821 approximately to 1851, the mail system in Peru was domestic only. If we needed to send a letter outside of the country, we needed to entrust it with a ship captain in order to take it to the next place because there was no connection of the Peruvian postal system with any external entity. 1840-something, it started that way, but between that time, there was nothing. So forwarding agents were the way to go in case you couldn't get all the way to Callao in order to send your letter entrusted with the ship captain and send it wherever needed to go. Only two forwarding agents have postal marks, or postmark, hand stamp, if you will. Martinet and Barot in Lima was one of them. This letter, the forwarding agent, is the earliest known from a forwarding agent. And this is from April 20, 1830. The other one is Crosby. Crosby was later in the, 40s, in the 1850s, and they have the forwarding agent business in Callao and also in Valparaiso in Chile. Right here, this being in 1830, we are entering the political instability period, the moment that we have many, many presidents showing up every other few months. This is also the time that we look other nationalities besides the Spanish and the Peruvian people connected. This is an early letter from Peru to China. When you look at this, you would think in the first glance, Peru and China, what is the connection? There is a lot of Chinese immigration to Peru, a lot of Asian immigration, Japanese immigration. This is an early letter that shows an establishment of a business importing tea and other spices from China by this gentleman, William Wedmore. He partnered with another guy, Alsop, I believe was the last name, and they have this business in 
Chile, and in Peru. But most of the letters known, which are not very many, from Peru to Asia happen to be from Peru. This is not the earliest. Last time I did this presentation, I claimed to be the earliest. Some, someone showed me one that is earlier than this. It's still very early, Peru to China, 1835. In instability period, during this time, an interesting political movement occurred. There was a war between Peru and Bolivia. And the war was sparked because Simón Bolívar wanted to unify the whole country, uh, or the whole continent. Simón Bolívar was the liberator of Venezuela and Colombia. What he did was he wanted to bring everyone together. He appointed one of his marshals, Mariscal Sucre, in order to start making that movement. Peru and Bolivia went into a war. The war, in the end, unified them into something called the Peruvian-Bolivian Confederation. This confederation lasted for three years. Peru was divided in two, North Peru, South Peru, and Republica Boliviana, or Bolivia. This is the only time that Lima was not the capital of Peru. During this time, Lima was the capital of North Peru, and Tacna in southern Peru, somewhere around here by Lake Titicaca in the coastal uh, shore of the Pacific Ocean, was the capital of the whole confederation. They tried to make it work, but they couldn't because the main reason of creating this was commerce and try to take advantage of each other's resources and availability to the sea access and all that. Peru was ahead of the game with that, so by 1839, the whole thing fell apart and the two countries became separate once again. In 1839, once the dissolution of the Confederation, there was a very short period of time that there were some rate changes and they were extremely cheap. This is from that period. It's called the Huancayo rates. Huancayo is a central city in the Andean part of Peru. Congress went there. They decided to create this particular rate table that did not work out because they started losing money like crazy. So this lasted for two months but in certain areas lasted only for one month. The older rates of 1826 were reestablished in 1841, and they start bringing now additional concessions to certain type of mail, in particular that mail that have to make things easier for the people that have no resources. During that time, there was one exception, and this is on judicial mail, and it's called the free frank exception. They call it pobre de solemnidad in Spanish. In English would be, uh, they give an exception to anyone indigent or a pauper person. What happened is if they were in that, in some litigation, and the movement of documents needed to occur, the court make a disclaimer on the back of this particular letter saying, okay, this person is so poor that he or she cannot afford to pay for postage, so there is an exception being made. Let it go, we make a discount, like a rebaja, but in reality it was a discount, and they just let it go. But there was only one exception to this exception in case the court needed to collect back the money. If the case involved some monetary compensation and the person who couldn't afford to pay for postage was the winner of that particular litigation, and the compensation was given to him or to her, the amount of the postage was to be discounted from that and give it back to the court. So the court, in a way, had a way to hopefully get some money back. Judicial letters from this period exist, but those with this particular exception, pobre de solemnidad, I counted six. This is one of the six. This is also the time that we are now switching into the Wano era. During the Wano era, there are a lot of mail coming from places that we will never imagine coming to Peru, like Algeria. And this letter talks about some traits of Wano between the northern African country of Algeria with Peru, with a famous merchant that a lot of the letters, and thanks to him, we have good representation of postal history in Peru, Tomás Lacham. He has the business in Peru, had a business in France, and I believe also has some in economic interest in Chile. This is the earliest of the four letters known to Peru from the African continent. Wano created a lot of commercial activities between the islands of Chincha, southern Peru, but more important between Callao and Lima. The Peruvian government tried to make that as fast as they could. This is 1849. By 1845, the government was seeing all this activity 
creating a lot of needs for faster communication. So they were planning during this time already the construction of the first railroad in the Pacific coast of South America. It's for many years was claimed to be the first railroad in South America. Actually, it's not. It's the second one. But it's the first commercial railroad. The first one was in British Guiana. It was a private cargo train. When the train was established here, a year later, or two years later, had not only the movement of cargo, but also mail and people. So during this time, they tried to reorganize. In 1849, reorganize the postal system. And they created some sort of express mail between Lima and Callao. This particular one is the earliest of those with an error. If you look at the letter D, it is inverted. It was corrected later on. About 10 letters with the inverted D exist. And this was mainly for sending mail from Lima to Callao for regular people. But they also created something else for commercial entities. And this is a label. This label can be considered the first stamp of Peru and is a provisional stamp. It's the only postmaster provisional that exists. The reason they printed this particular label on this yellowish background was to be sold for bulk mail that commercial companies needed to send between Lima and Callao. It was flat rate one real. That was the, the price that the Franca label was sold for. And it doesn't matter how heavy or not the letter or the content was, it was a flat rate of one real. There are 10 covers known with the Franca label. Eight are sent to the same archive, the same person, the Thomas Lacham. And there are two that are not. This is one of the two. This is inbound from Valparaiso when it arrived to Callao to pay the one real rate or inbound rate, instead of having it with a hand stamp, they use the Franca label. I was talking about the establishment of the first railroad between Lima and Callao. That one was opened on May 17, 1851, between Lima and Callao. The moment it was opened was the moment that mail was carried on train. This particular cover has the stumpstone nice postmark from Callao, Callao Vapor, a steamship coming in. And it is the earliest known cover that traveled in the Lima Callao train between the two cities, one week after it was opened. Mail from any other Latin American country with the exception of Chile, Bolivia, and Ecuador in that order, from any other Latin American country inbound to Peru or outbound to Peru is extremely rare. This one is an inbound from Mexico. I believe Mexico was going through some little turmoil during that time, 1851. So it was sent from Mazatlan to Lima. The one over here is just the inbound rate, the one real that was for all maritime inbound mail coming into Peru. I talk about the exception on judicial mail. There was a second exception, printed matter. Printed matter was free. No matter how heavy the content was, one kilo, a hundred kilos, doesn't really matter. It was free. So postal users took advantage of that. And what they started to do were sending anything but printed matter with impact. There are some letters or some re postal records that talk that people sending clothing, food, shoes, anything but printed matter. So at some point, it was established that the opening of the content was required, and the declaration of what was inside needed to be signed by the postal clerk. So here is one from 1852. It says, no postal charge, as it contained only printed matter. And it comes from Chachapoyas, which is in the Peruvian Amazon region, northeast, I guess. Of course, there were ways to get around that. But printed matter was free all the way to 1874. So for 22 more years, this situation was still occurring. Mail was heavy in volume between the different places that commerce was occurring and communications and all that. So postal clerks make mistakes, right? The rates that they needed to apply sometimes didn't correspond or they misused a different hand stamp in order to mark that. The letter was supposed to be charged. And two, 
null and void postmarks were issued. The ones over here. Actually, there are two. This is the only cover that has the two in the same letter. It has a solid circle and this floral over here. So whatever rate was behind these two was voided, and then the rate for this letter is only two real. This is the only cover that exists with the two. Covers with one of the two void postmarks are also rare, but there are a few more of those. It still is a very rare mark from the period. This is the development all the way until pretty much 1856. And I'm going to make a stop over here because this is the time, 1857, the introduction of stamps in Peru. And Peru had a process in order to get there. Postmaster General of the time, Jose Davila Condemarine, started looking into all the inbound mail to Peru from different places. They were coming with stamps. It was great to have the prepaid with a stamp system implemented outside, but more important, implemented in Peru. So what he decided to do was to implement this system. The Pacific Steam Navigation Company printed these two stamps for their own private use in 1847, 10 years before that where we are here. So they printed because they were carrying mail between the ports of South America, and they thought that they could use these stamps for the covers that they were carrying on their postmarks. But because they were in the South American territory, they need to ask for permission. So they consulted with the countries in the Pacific coast of South America, Chile, Bolivia at the time, Peru, Ecuador. Colombia had a Pacific coast, in that case goes all the way to Panama. I'm not sure if they consulted with Panama, but they consulted with the other four. And the answer they got was a flat no. They couldn't use them, period. What did they do? They took all these stamps that were already printed and they stored them at their vaults in the port of Callao. For 10 years, 1847 were printed, all the way to 1857 when Jose Davila Condemarin wanted to implement this. The Pacific Steam Agent in Lima learned about that and in a gesture of friendship offered these two stamps to him to try the system. So when we talk about the Pacific Steam stamps used in Peru, they were never used by the Pacific stamps. The closest they got to the water were the bolts, because these stamps were used only as a trial between the city of Lima, Callao, and Chorrillo for three months and three months only, and thereafter they were destroyed. There are, of course, use are kind of rare. There are six covers known. Four correspond to the locations that they needed to be used, Lima, Callao, and Chorrillo. There are two other covers that go somewhere else. They, they exist. Of course, other bogus forgery, whatever, may exist. But those six are within the right regulation. This one goes from uh, Callao to Lima and is the latest known. This is March 4, 1858. The system proved to be working. People bought the stamps. They used them for postage. The postal system no longer have to do the COD and the rejects of some of the letters that they needed. Everything was good. So March 10, 1858, countrywide introduction of the prepaid with stamps was implemented in Peru. The rates were overly simplified. One peseta, single rate two pesetas double rate, and going forward would be one peseta for any additional ounce. That was very easy. There was only one exception for rate reduction. 25 leaks or less between the two points will pay half of it. This is the one peseta stamp. It goes from Lima to Arequipa. Arequipa is the second largest city in Peru in the southern side. Single rate, one peseta. From this point on, 1858, it was mandatory to pay every letter with stamp, period. The domestic part of postage needed to be paid with Peruvian stamps. Of course, there were ways to get around that. One of the ways was taking the letters only for those going outside of Peru to the British Post Office, for example, and routed it over there to the final destination. In this case, this letter goes to New York. This letter should have paid the one dinero Peruvian domestic rate, but it did not pay because the user, Thomas Lacham, 
took it directly to the BPO, the British Post Office at Callao, and he routed it to New York. The rate was six pence from Callao to Panama, and of course, whatever else went from that leg, Panama to, to New York. This letter in particular is very interesting because it arrived to the U.S. during the U.S. Civil War blockade of the South. So instead of sending it to the normal route, Panama, maybe St. Thomas, and then to New York, they send it via San Francisco just because of the blockage of the South. I have seen from Peru only one more letter, a little earlier than this, during the same period. Most of the letters always got Panama to New York directly. During this time as well, there was another introduction. At that time, letters were delivered to the post office and the users needed to go to the post office in order to claim whatever mail they have. So the post offices have large billboards outside putting Henry Marquez got a letter, so I have to go check it out, wait in line, prove it myself, they give me my letter. In November 1863, they changed all that and they said, now we are going to deliver your mail to your house. And they introduced this particular postmark, Conducción del Cartero Gratis, home delivery free of charge by the postman. So in order to advertise this, letters started to be stamped with it. This postmark in blue is kind of rare. I have counted six covers, and they are all between November to early December 1863. From 1864 on, they are all in black. Another train discount. In 1863, there was a reorganization, and now the flat rate within Peru was half, one dinero, with the exception of the mail-by-train discount. So at this time, in 1866, it was decided to cut it in half. One dinero will be half of a dinero, but since 1857, Peru was going through the process of decimalization. In this particular case, what happened in Peru is the one peso, which was eight reales, was made equivalent to one sol. Sol is the currency of Peru, equivalent to 100 centavos. So they just adjusted it that way. If you have one peso, now it's, it's one sol, period. There is no additional calculation other than during this time, there was no five centavo of the stamp, so the postal uh, administration allowed to have bisects of the one dinero until they have the first five centavo stamp printed, which happened in June 1866, approximately. So these bisects exist. They are between Lima and Callao. Interestingly enough, mail from Lima to Callao is about 20 times more difficult to find than the Callao to Lima. The reason is because the archives that are kept today are mainly from Lima, not from Callao. So Lima to Callao, 20 times more difficult to find. The one on top is Lima to Callao, the other one is Callao to Lima. Certification. The certification process during all this period had one concession. When the certified letter was delivered, it was supposed to be signed by the recipient and the cover give back to the postal office. That front sheet was supposed to stay at the post office for one year and after that was incinerated. Certified mail from this period is rare. However, there was one town that decided not to burn some and those are that exist today, Juan Cabelica. Juan Cabelica kept some of the covers from the classic period from after 1874, there are more, but before 1874, there are a few, and this is one of them. During this period, there was a little political turmoil. Whatever discounts the previous president granted for the service were voided, and everything went back to what was 40 years before. During those 40 years before, the certification was 50 centavos, was no longer 20, which was implemented at that time. So this letter happens to be a double rate certified, double rate to dineros. The registration was 50 centavos or five dineros, seven in total. There are about 12 of these covers known. This is the most pristine of all of them. Postage due, and I'm gonna talk about the predecessor of the actual printed postage due. Jose Davila Condemarin, the Postmaster General, implemented a very specific and very meticulous process 
to review that letters complied with the right postage to the right destination and all that. So he implemented some of these deficit postmarks whenever there were a deficiency. This particular one had the deficit postmarks from two different cities, one Cabelica being one, the one in blue, and Lima to be the, the black one over there. What happened here is that this letter only paid with three dineros later on before being sent to Lima was detected to be short paid 30 centavos, the reason of the 20 and the 10. But when it arrived to Lima, it says, no, you know what? It's not 30 that was deficit here, it was 70. So they added up the whole thing instead of voiding it. As far as I know, this is the only cover that has that compound postage due. I have seen covers with different ones, but this is the only one we've compounded. Stamps from other countries were also used in Peru, mainly the UK and also American stamps. But the American stamps were used only at the consulate, the embassy of the United States in Peru. The rate here is 10 centavos, which was the inbound rate for foreign mail into the US, sent from the consulate of the United States at Callao. And when it arrived, it was also postage due 10 centavos. I do believe that what happened here is that in reality it was heavy enough not to be 10 centavos or 10 cents inbound. It was supposed to be 20 cents inbound. And that's the reason why they added the 10 centavos. It has the New York steamship postmark applied to, to this too. A controversial cover. During this time, the rates were 10 centavos domestic, 5 centavos the discount and all that. The city of Lima was big, but not big enough. And it was a, a walled city. So the postal administration wanted to motivate Limeños to use the postal system within the city. So they reduce the interest city rate to two centavos, and they issue this stamp. It's called the Yamita stamp, the Lama. This rate is so rare, and the reason being because the people who wrote letters within Lima were people that had the servants that could take the written note from one part of the city to the other. That was no big deal. Mail within Lima within this period is extremely rare. Between 1821 to 1884, there are only seven letters known. That's it, seven. Out of those seven, probably this one is the most iconic. For years, it was considered to be a fabricated one. Recently, it was taken through some scientific process to validate the ink oxidation, the age of the paper, the adherence between the two for how long it been. And it was already pre-certified by Brian Moorhouse and has another certification from some uh, philatelic institute in Germany. So today, as we stand, this is the only cover with the two centavos yama that have ever proved to be genuine. We talk about foreign stamps used in Peru, in this case, British stamps. It's a co mixed combination between Peru, the brown stamp with the other two. The 20 centavos brown stamp is kind of rare on cover, and I was told that the two shilling blue is also rare, so make it a kind of a nice combination over here. This one goes to Liverpool, and of course, that has no inbound rate, inbound marks, because it was already prepaid from Peru to Liverpool. This is the first officially sealed cover of Peru, 1875. And I'm going to make a little parenthesis, because this one has a little story, personal story, that I would like to share with you. In 1988, I was in a meeting at the Asociación Filatélica Peruana with some of the friends at the time and all that. And two people showed up with a little folder with some covers for sale. So my friend and I look at it. They opened the binder that they had, had different covers. They were all registered. They were all the Juan Cabelica covers that I mentioned earlier on. And this one wasn't in what they bought as a sample. And of course, the more renowned philatelists that were at the meeting were asking them for how much they would sell it because they were very rare covers. Anyhow, so one of them make an appointment to go to their house in order to see what else do they have. Of course, my friend and I were very young. We were in our 20s. And we also made an appointment. And the renowned philatelist, which was a 
gentleman, a fantastic friend. Went before, but he went with consultant, and the consultant started bringing down the prices that the two people became very suspicious. And they said, you know what? Let us think about it. We have somebody else that are going to come later. So my friend and I showed up around 9.30 PM. I knew what we were walking to. And what happened is during that time, I was six months to get married. And I have some money. And I have to talk to now my wife to say, Jenny, I have found this thing. And all the money that I have is related to our wedding. Would you be OK if I were to use that money to buy cover? <laughs> She looked at me, and I said, I promise I'm going to get the money before we get married, so everything is going to continue without a problem. She said she trusts me, which is a great thing. We are still married, so she trusts me for sure. <laughs> I went over there with all that money. My friend had some money, too, because he was also saving for getting married. We went over there, and all the prices were labeled with all the covers. And of course, we doubled everything. And on, we only have $5 bill, $10 bill. So it was kind of a nice pile over there. We bought everything. But when I saw this cover the first time, I said, you know what? What that piece of paper is doing there? That's ugly. I don't like it. I'm going to leave it there. I left this, and we left another one. So of course, we went away. We distributed everything. I got my package that I needed to sell. I sent it to Lash and a few others for different auctions to get my money back so I can get married and still, still be alive. So. I walk away. When I start learning a little bit more about philately, I re re regret it, no buying this cover, because it was the first officially sealed cover of Peru. Of course, the renowned philatelists that we are talking about showed up the next day, said, OK, I'm ready to buy everything. I'm sorry, we sold the whole thing. We have a few things for you. He bought this one and a few other things that we left. So for 20 years, this cover was in his collection until he passed away. And the collection was put for sale, and I bought it, of course, magnitude of times higher than I could have bought it the first day. <laughs> but that's OK. You know, nothing, nobody's perfect. So that's the story of this. It's the only one known. I also collect official seals and, and registration seals. In the world, this one beats everything, because the first officially sealed cover or officially sealed that was issued in the world was in Italy in 1872. We're talking 1875 in Peru. And they already have something. And they have the imprint on the wax seal and the whole thing. This, uh, for me, this is amazing. Postage due. In 1874, there was a postal reform. No longer there is a printed matter. We are going to print postage due stamps. These postage due have interesting characteristics. They were supposed to pay for the inbound, but also there is a concession something in order to pay for deferred payment main in official mail. The one on the right-hand side is that case. So this one was sent from some governmental agency, a Juan Cabelica cover again. And it went to, from Lima over there with the postage due stamps used as a COD of deferred payment for that. These stamps were also used in judicial covers for the same situation. This one in particular goes from Lima to Callao, and everyone would thought, OK, probably that's the most common destination. No for judicial cover. Probably this is one of the rarest of all those. 1878, the Universal Postal Union. Before that, we all know there was a general postal union. Peru was not a member of it. But Peru tried to be a member of the Universal Postal Union at the first Congress of Paris in 1878. So they show up over there. They said, we are ready to be that. And they said, you know what? You are not ready. Why is that? The one that was against Peru joining the UPU was England. And the reason was because they have the mail service in Peru, the British Post offices, and they were making good business out of that. This is the one of period. And even though it was the decade of crisis, there was still a lot of mail going out of Peru. So in order to demotivate that, the argument was, you, Peru, have no way to move mail from the Pacific coast to the Atlantic coast in Panama. You need to establish an agency in Panama before we let you join the UPU. So for one year, Peru tried to establish that. And in order to motivate or demotivate even more what they did, the UK knocked down their rate to Peru to one third. Instead of one shilling, six pence, it went directly to six pence. This one is a one shilling, and it was postage due, double rate, inbound to Peru. You know, but Peruvians are known for one thing or many things, 
but one of them is to be persistent. Peruvians keep trying. And they establish the postal agency in Panama sometime early 1879. And finally, they were accepted as a member of the Universal Postal Union sometime mid-June 1879. Another interesting piece with a personal correlation. This is the only document that proves when Peru joined the UPU. And this document, I didn't know, and I asked a lot of the collectors who had it, and no one told me who had it, until one day showed up in auction, in a nice lot with color covers and all that. And I couldn't care less about the covers, I care about this one. So I was lucky enough to get it. At the time of joining the UPU, Peru was in war with Chile, and inflation was very high. So the rate that was supposed to be 11 centavos, hard money, was actually 27 centavos in Peruvian money. And as you see the cover over here, this, this 27 centavos rate were used only between June 1879 to December 1879. In January 1880, the first UPU plata, or silver, stamps were issued. They were supposed to be in hard money. The transitional period of 27 has one rarity, which is certified mail. This is the first certified cover going out of Peru under the UPU rule. The rate was 63 centavos. Inflationary, it was supposed to be only 21, but because inflation, 63. This is the first one known. And it had a delay. It was delayed 30 days in Panama because the postal agency in Panama probably was handling certified mail for the first time, and they said, what do we do with this? They took an extra month just to deliver that in Panama. UPU plata stamps were issued, 1880. This one goes from Lima to Germany. The rate in the beginning was 12 centavos, but that was a mistake because the long run maritime rate that UPU allowed for countries with low volume was five centavos. Five centavos was the regular postage to be covered. And one centavo was supposed to be the crossing of Panama. But because Peru interpreted literally, said you can double the maritime rate, they also double the Panama crossing. That's why rates with the 12 centavos exist. Later, in 1881, they fixed it to make it one centavo. The reason there are Plata Peru stamps occur because this is the time of the war. And when Chile occupied Lima, Chileans were not part of the UPU. So the postmaster general at the time was accountable and he wrote a letter to the UPU and said, you know what, from this point on, I can only be responsible for the mail going out from Lima. I don't care about anything else, it's not my problem. So overnight, the UPU Plata Lima overprint was issued. The rate was revised because in April of 1881, also Chile joined the UPU and they were doing the whole thing, Chileans were in Peru, it was put back into the right timeline. The war continues. When Lima was occupied, the Chileans believed that the war was over, but it wasn't, because they, now the free government moves out of Peru. So for a period of time, Peruvian stamps were still used. But in December 1881, the Peruvian stamps were overprinted with the Chilean coat of arms. Those covers are kind of difficult to find. And later on, they start using Chilean stamps in the occupied territories in Peru. You have here the two particular usage of that. War ended with the Treaty of Ancon in 1883. That was signed October 20, 1883. From October 20 to October 23rd, for three days, they were in negotiations what to do. The postal system was supposed to come back to Peru, but Peruvian stamps were all over. People may have had old stamps and Peruvians didn't want them to be used. So what the postal administration did, they issued this triangular overprint and whatever stamps they found at the postal offices were overprinted with this. There are 11 types. Type one, of course, was the first one used in December 1883. October 20, sign of the Treaty of Ancon. October 23rd, it came back, the postal administration came back to Peruvian hands and never again was ruled by anyone else. That's the story, postal history of Peru or Lima between 1821 to 1884.
And at this point, if you have any questions, I may be able to answer. I was very interested because I have an early collection at one point of chili. And the one thing that I think was really interesting, and you mentioned guano, and you mentioned saltpeter, and the reason for the economics of that section was that both of those things are the source of the potassium nitrate, which combines with sulfur and charcoal to make gunpowder. Yep. And of course, that's, that's right. the whole key to the situation for the economics is the gunpowder. It was just it was fascinating. And I, I, if somebody wasn't an engineer or wasn't familiar with that, that was the real reason for it, because the world was looking for those materials for gunpowder. Exactly. Thank you for highlighting that. I would like to thank Henry Marquez for his sharing with us his thoughts on Lima's postal history. For further information about the Peruvian Philatelic Society, please visit their website. On behalf of the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, I'd like to thank you for having taken the time to visit with us on this video. You'll find that this is one of a number of videos that we've produced over the years in a, the effort to provide educational services to the stamp collecting public. The Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library is located in Denver, Colorado at 2038 South Pontiac Way. Our hours are 10 to 4, 5 days a week with one day of extended hours. The library offers collectors of every kind and to the general public a host of materials that are related to stamp collecting and world history. There are over 60,000 journals contained in 800 specific journals. We have a map room, we have special collections devoted to individual countries, and we have special libraries that are devoted to individual countries. For further information about the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, we invite you to visit the library or visit us online at our website.